Hi, Arman. Hi, Amin. Welcome uh, to our program again. Um, I uh, I want to thank you for agreeing to talk with us. I will introduce you to our um, uh, viewers, those of you, those for those who don't know yet. So Arman Grigorian is a friend, and he's a um, uh, professor, associate professor at Lehigh University uh, in United States. Uh, Arman, um, I would like to ask you. I would like really to know your opinion about what do you think are now main points of disagreements uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, between the two governments, um, on the road of achieving peace agreement? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. I mean, it's, it's good to see you. It's been a while. And uh, I want to uh, extend my greetings to the audience of, of the Hayakshi. So the main obstacles, they are pretty well known. Ever since the, the ceasefire, there have been three main issues that have been subject to negotiations and, and disagreement. One is Karabakh's status. The other one is the issue of demarcation and delimitation, which also involves the issue of certain enclaves. And the third one is the communications, or sometimes it is referred to as corridor in Azerbaijan through southern, southern Armenia, where it should pass and what status it should have. Uh, these are the, the three main issues of disagreements uh, that have been, as I said, subject to negotiations since the end of the war. Of course, when negotiations continue and there is no peace and uh, there is no peace agreement, new issues arise all the time. There are all sorts of, uh, uh, all sorts of problems that have emerged in the process of of this continued failure to reach an agreement. For example, the escalation in September of this year has essentially created a new reality, a new issue. There are Azerbaijani troops now in, in parts of Armenia and, uh, and there are all sorts of other issues um, that, that, that are, um, uh, that, that, you know, contribute to the conflict and contribute to the acrimony. But um, as I said, these are the three main issues which have been subject uh, to disagreement since um, uh, since the ceasefire of November 9th, 2020. If we go into details, you pointed out to three main issues, the, the status of Karabakh, this, which uh, Armenia is insisting on, and uh, Aliyev, President Aliyev, is saying that you know this problem doesn't exist. There is a demarcation issue, which you know in some countries, uh, you know uh, Azerbaijan still has demarcation issues. You know with with Georgia, Armenia has like you know uh, this demarcation also uh, may continue. You know uh, quite some time even between the countries where there is no conflict as such. Um, so what is the specific problem between Armenia and Azerbaijan here? And of course, the issue of the corridor, you know, like uh, I'm, it's really interesting for me, like, you know, from Azerbaijan's side, it is, you know, there is a Lachin corridor and we want to have the Zangezur corridor. It's fair. We connect you with, you know, Armenians who live in Karabakh and we would like you to connect us with Azerbaijanis living uh, in, in Nakhichevan. So uh, could you go into the, like this, uh, in detail in these three issues and explain uh, where are actually the problems, where both parties, you know, stand and what agreement, why these agreements cannot be achieved on these three issues? Okay, so let's start from the easiest one, which is the demarcation, the delimitation problem. I mean, in terms of, the, the technical aspects of it, it may take some time. Uh, I read a couple months ago that the, the delimitation uh, and the demarcation of the Armenian-Georgian border took like several years and it was completed relatively recently, actually. So it did finish actually between Georgia and Armenia. It's now over. It's, I think it's over, yeah. It's over, but it took quite a few years but it was not subject to any serious conflicts and, and major disagreements. And it was mainly 
mainly technical work. With Azerbaijan, it's different because there are uh, certain certain areas which used to be officially part of Soviet Azerbaijan during the Soviet period, and there were enclaves inside Armenia. There was one of those also, which was an Armenian enclave within Azerbaijan, the Artsvashen village. And uh, I mean, you, you want to to figure out how how to resolve this problem and to make it to to reach a viable agreement. So that it's not a constant problem, a constant source of tensions, constant so source of friction, etc. Moreover, um, moreover, yeah, there is there is the possibility of of certain exchanges, uh, like you know, Armenia relinquishes its claims on Artsvashen, and Azerbaijan relinquishes on an equivalent territory which used to be Azerbaijani enclaves. Um, so I imagine these sort of issues are being uh, are being negotiated. Also, one of the main problems probably related to demarcation is that some of the roads are in Armenia and uh, roads that are connecting Armenia to Georgia are passing through some of these enclaves. And one of them also is passing through the, the Tigranashen, which used to be Kharki um, in the in the Vyodzor district. And that also connects northern Armenia to southern Armenia. So the status of these roads and, and all the consequences um, that will result from it, you know, I, th I, think, uh, I think that's why, uh, that's, that's what the negotiations are about and that's why it's, uh, it has, it is, um, it, it is related to some difficulties and some problems. But I think this is probably the easiest uh, one of the issues, uh, of the three issues that Armenia and Azerbaijan are negotiating. Even though there are disagreements there, I think they can be they can be resolved with some uh, with with goodwill and and some effort. And they uh, can be also agreed to be resolved in the within the next 10, 20 years, sure. which is normal practice between many countries. Like Absolutely. In that in that uh, regard, I don't think there is any rush. I think if there is a peace agreement that can be dealt with as a technical process, essentially. Or even if it's not a purely technical process, I think these things can be can be negotiated, even if they take time. It's not it's not um, it's not the sort of issue that uh, that that can uh, lead the countries to a deadlock in the negotiations. The deadlocks are are mostly related to the issue of Karabakh status and. Uh, and uh, the road connecting Azer the main line, uh, mainland Azerbaijan with Nahijevan. So what, what are the issues there? So let's, uh, let's I, I guess, let's dispense with the issue of the status first. Uh, the problem here is not only or even mainly that Armenians are insisting on some status. Yes, you're right. There are Armenians who are arguing not only that Karabakh should have a special status. There are Armenians who are still arguing that Karabakh should not be a part of Azerbaijan, including including Armenians in Karabakh, you know, some who, who make that argument there. Now, whether or not this is justified, whether or not this is fair, I'm not I'm not interested in having that kind of a conversation. I'm a realist. I usually avoid conversations about what is fair, what is legitimate, what, what is honest, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't think politics is based on such categories. Uh, Azerbaijanis who are uh, appalled by such demands and such claims, for example, uh, and recently they have started talking about the rights of Azerbaijanis in Iran. Uh, the, on, on one occasion, I asked uh, an Azerbaijani colleague um, what he thinks about Northern Cyprus, and he gave me an evasive answer. So we all know that we invoke certain principles and certain uh, concepts of legitimacy to fit what is in our interest. And, and I don't want to have that conversation. I don't want to have that conversation with Azerbaijanis or with Armenians. The problem in Karabakh now is that Armenia has lost the war, and whatever it, it whatever demands it makes has to be has to be commensurate with the consequences of the war and with the existing balance of power. And the truth is that Armenia has lost its ability to dictate terms there, 
or to even um, have a major influence on how the status issue will be resolved by virtue of the by, by uh, virtue of the fact that it lost the war and it's in a very very weakened position. So that's just the bitter reality for Armenians, whether or not their demands are legitimate or justified in some abstract sense. But the problem here that Azerbaijan has to take into account um, is, is twofold. Now, first of all, given what Armenians and Azerbaijanis have been through over the, over the last 30 years, even if Azerbaijan has the best of intentions toward Karabakh Armenians, the argument that Karabakh Armenians should be fully integrated as Azerbaijani citizens and have no distinguished status, no distinguished right, and that's the, the only guarantee they are going to get, is just not going to be very convincing and very reassuring to many Armenians. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize something. I don't want to, I don't want to attribute any bad motives to the Azerbaijani state, to the Azerbaijani government, even if they have the best of intentions. And I want to emphasize this. They have a serious problem because of that massive uh, gap in the distribution of power. If they, they change their mind in the future, they can persecute Armenians in Karabakh. They can take advantage of them. They can discriminate against them. And there is not much that they can do to tie their hands against such behavior in the future. So in political, I, I hate to get uh, academic about this, but the, we call this a commitment problem in, in the study of ethnic conflicts. And this is what Azerbaijan, uh, this is what uh, Azerbaijanis, uh, the Azerbaijani state and Karabakh Armenians are dealing with. The second problem related to Karabakh is that Armenia and Armenians are not the only opponents of Azerbaijan in this context and in the context of Karabakh status. It is also Russia. I mean, I imagine even other countries, France, the United States, are probably not sold on the idea that there should be absolutely no status. After all, Karabakh did have some kind of a status even in, in Soviet times, right? And that there should be no distinguished status for Karabakh Armenians. I don't even know that these, these states agree. But the most important uh, opposition probably comes from Russia. And Russia has its own, uh, own incentives and interests uh, to make sure that uh, the Karabakh conflict is not resolved in such a way where the status issue uh, gets a, uh, the status gets a final definition and Karabakh Armenians are fully integrated into Azerbaijan, which would uh, which would make the presence of Russian peacekeepers uh, completely unnecessary. Uh, and pointless, and in turn, that may uh, have consequences for the Russian influence and the Russian uh, presence in, in the Southern Caucasus. In fact, it might even, might even affect the Russian influence in Armenia, not just in Azerbaijan, if the conflict was resolved in such a manner. And again, I don't mean this as a criticism of Russia. This is something that all great powers or all, all states in general are very, uh, very attentive to things that improve or decrease their power positions, right? So they're sensitive to these things. And such a resolution might result in uh, undermining or diminishing Russia's positions in the Caucasus. And that's why Russia, uh, Russia is uh, proposing a, a kind of solution which uh, puts off the issue of status to, to the future. So it's kind of a new step-by-step -step, uh, plan that, that the Russians have in mind, which, um, you know, which envisions a peace treaty between Armenia and Azerbaijan without a final determination of Karabakh status. I know I'm speaking uh, too long, but uh, just briefly on the issue of the, of, uh, of the communication through, through Southern Armenia or the corridor through Southern Armenia. Before, this... before, you, before you go okay. to communication, I just want... Uh, I have like two points, questions, which I will try to connect and maybe you can finish this and then we can go to communications. Look, you said that uh, this question of status, you know, and, and and we will talk through interview to this. There is kind of this public and diplomatic language that both sides are using and arguments, but then there is reality. 
you know, then there is reality that both sides have to deal with. And so, um, you know, when, uh, for how I understand the position of Azerbaijan government, when Armenian government talks about that we need a status for, you know, Armenians in Karabakh, uh, for Azerbaijani government, I think, you know, it's not about giving or not giving status. There is a history, and from Azerbaijan perspective, the, uh, always the special status of Armenians in Karabakh, it's just a time bomb, you know. It's once there is a status, once the central power in Azerbaijan becomes weaker, or empire collapses, or some tectonic uh, geopolitical changes are happening, then this status helps, like Armenians of Karabakh, to unite and I don't know, want to leave Azerbaijan again. So this happened already a couple of times, and. Uh, just from Azerbaijani perspective, there was a victory and we always had this problem and we want to finish problem once and for all. And it's not a problem for us of Armenians living or not living in Azerbaijan, but it's a problem that the status can give them more power like in 20 years to start another war, another secession movement. So, and I, again, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, I'm not judging, I'm, I'm just trying to describe maybe what Azerbaijani government people think sitting at this table, but you know, with, without telling this, because you know, if you tell this at publicly, you cannot tell this. Armenian side, on the other side, uh, you know, and I've heard a lot of, uh, or at least some Armenian experts, uh, prominent Armenian experts saying this, well, Armenia just needs to win some time uh, and to buy more weapons, to find better allies, to wait for a better geopolitical weather, and just, you know, to start another war and take Karabakh back, you know, or keep Karabakh and expand whatever is now Armenian part of Karabakh. Um, so there is, you know, this kind of different views, and, and, and you know, uh, uh, you could say that, okay, let's, let's use this now to have some special rights, so something to build upon, you know, later. Uh, don't you think this is, the, you know, really what's going on? And in reality, as you said, uh, you know, it will not be, the decision will not be made uh, because Azerbaijani government really cares about Armenians living in Karabakh or because Armenian government, uh, you know, really wants just status you know, for Armenians in Karabakh. Um, but, the, you know, so it will be resolved more. We're coming now to, you know, foreign influence, you know. Uh, how much Russia will be able to stop Azerbaijan and maybe Azerbaijan and Turkey from, you know, um, uh, avoiding or, or, or not giving any status to Armenians, you know, in Karabakh. So it will be basically the result of, I don't know, bigger powers, negotiations, or even Russia's, um, I don't know, kind of, I don't want even to say decision, because, uh, you know, we really don't know what happens. Maybe there are big negotiations or, you know, trade is going on, you know, beyond what public eyes can see. And as it happened in history, maybe, you know, there will be decisions made and they may not be even, you know, really made, you know, in Yerevan or even in Baku. So we are coming now to another issue of, I would like your perspective on how you see in reality, who gonna decide if Armenians will have status in Karabakh or not. Is it decided, as Aliyev says, and they will never get it? Or uh, is Russia pretending that it is fighting for Armenian status? Don't you think that anything can happen in this regard, you know? And this will uh, not be even the decision that is made in Yerevan. Yes, uh, it will not be made in Yerevan. That's what I was saying in my initial response. That's what I've said a couple of times 
when I've been in conversations with uh, Azerbaijani diplomats and, and Azerbaijani experts, uh, sometimes when they when they talk about what Armenians should or should should not accept, you know, then this is what I've I've told them repeatedly: your opponent is not Armenia. You know, on this issue, or at least it's not only Armenia, or it's not mainly Armenia. If your opponent was Armenia, this would be over a long time ago. Unfortunately, again, I'm a realist. You know, if Armenia and Azerbaijan were left to their own devices after November 9th, I don't think uh, uh, Azerbaijan was, would stop where it stopped, right? I mean, let's let's be let's be realistic about this. But that's the problem. Azerbaijan's opponent is not only Armenia or even mainly Armenia on the status issue. With regard to Azerbaijan's concerns about what happens if Armenians get a status, uh, not only I agree with you, I have written the paper about this, not about the Armenian Azerbaijani case, but as a general matter of why sometimes, well, why sometimes small or medium-sized powers are reluctant to give a status to their minorities, to empower their minorities. Uh, because they fear that regardless of the minority's intentions or motives at the time, uh, that status or that empowerment can ser serve future secessionist, secessionist goals, right? So this paper was published in 2015 in the journal International Security. Sorry for the plug, but your readers probably would like to read it. It's called Concessions or Coercion. Uh, why... Uh, uh, how states deal with restive minorities. I think that was uh, that was the subtitle subtitle of the paper. So I think Azerbaijan's uh, concerns are justified. I think not only they are justified, the same kind of argument can be made in reverse, which is regardless of how benign Armenians' motives are, right? Even if they have no secessionist motives today, right? If that empowerment were to happen. Uh, it is conceivable that it could be used for for future secessionist secessionist bids by by Armenians, and this is completely irrational for Azerbaijanis to worry about. But the two problems here are uh, number one, you know, then what are they going to do about it? Right? What's the solution to it? Are we uh, are we really going to argue that the, then then the correct solution is to get rid of the Armenians altogether? The second problem is that, again, they have to deal with a kind of reality, which involves not only the Armenians, but other interested third parties, namely Russia. And that, you know, does Azerbaijan want to create a situation where it gets into conflict with Russia on this issue? And I understand that uh, Russia is now busy with other things, but this is not something that that, that Russia can simply simply ignore either and uh there was a there was a third point uh i was i was going to make but now i forgot what no yeah you you will start talking in a minute about communication but i i wanted to finish no, in, about uh, this about the status about issue this, i had a th uh, third issue. point but, but no, I, think, I i want to connect what we just talked about with you know it's an interesting situation so on the one side there is argument about rights of minorities in Azerbaijan. So rights of Armenian population in Karabakh in Azerbaijan. Uh, this is argument that is made. But it is really kind of amusing that this right is used or this argument is used by Russia, you know, to strengthen its influence in the South Caucasus. And on the other hand, I, I'm coming now, I want you to open up a little bit for our audience this connection and influence and interest of foreign powers. So we have a situation where basically Russia is pushing for status, special status of Armenians in Karabakh, which will strengthen and cement or uh, continue to help to keep Russian uh, presence and influence in South Caucasus, on the one hand. On the other hand, we have a situation where here where France and United States and Western powers, you know, who are fighting against Russian influence, you know, I don't know, in Ukraine, in, in, in the whole of Europe, uh, at this point here, they are basically are supporting Russian, uh, I don't know, 
position or they are agreeing like, yes, Azerbaijan should give this status, but understanding that political and geopolitically, it will mean that Russia will keep this conflict in some form just, you know, in its sleeves and continue, you know, putting pressure on both Armenia and Azerbaijan, you know, and don't you think there is some kind of, um, I don't know, uh, you have almost here alliance of Russia, Iran and France, you know, uh, and in some way, I think this argument of minorities is also accepted in European Union, in US, and then you have a situation where this argument strengthens Russia's hand in South Caucasus. Like, is there is a contradiction or how you would like open and explain this uh, situation, this influence of foreign powers on this conflict resolution at the moment? Okay, so uh, first of all... And strange I, alliances. I, I don't think there is a kind of alliance or alignment of positions and interests between Russia on one hand and France and the United States on the other that you're uh, that uh, the, that you're mentioning. Uh, I don't think there is there is an alignment there. And secondly, and, and I'll explain to you what their differences are. But uh, in this regard, I want to remind you of something which we did together. If you remember, we published a, a paper in Newsweek shortly after, after the war, where we argued that what is going to be very, very important if the negotiations, if the peace negotiations are to be successful, is for third parties to act in cooperation and in unison. If third parties begin competing in the Caucasus, and this was the, the key argument of, of our article in Newsweek, if the third parties begin to compete with each other for influence, then it is going to make things much more difficult. It's going to, to have a much more destabilizing effect. It was before, this article was published before Ukraine, Russia. That's right. War started. That's exactly right. It was published when it was conceivable that uh, that these countries might actually cooperate on some on some issues. Although even then, uh, to to be honest, I was not I was not terribly optimistic because for thirty years they have not been cooperating in the South Caucasus. They have been competing, even if not to this degree as they are competing now. Um, you know, following following the the war in Ukraine. Now, what what is the what is their uh, what is the problem with their competition, and what are actually the differences in in the approaches between Russia and and the Western would be would be mediators of the Armenian Azerbaijani peace talks, um, or why would be the Western mediators of the Ar Armenian Azerbaijani peace talks? Uh, Russia does insist on not determining any status. Russia is not saying let's give Karabakh some kind of an autonomy or some kind of a political status and have a final package solution where all issues are resolved in, in one fell swoop and uh, there is a peace treaty and there are no outstanding issues remaining. Russians are arguing, and I might say, regardless of what their motives are, there is some logic, there is considerable logic to their argument, that the, the positions and the fears and, and the wounds of the parties are such that hoping that any agreement on the status can be reached at this point, which would minimally satisfy all, all sides, is just a, uh, is just, just a chimera. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not going to happen. So it is, it is better to, to leave it for, for the future. It is better for Armenia and Azerbaijan to go through a, a period of confidence building and learn to live with each other and cooperate with each other. And maybe the status issue will become less important you know, for the next generation or, or, or in a few years. But again, this is not to say that I dismiss the concerns that you were talking about or the, or the fears that Azerbaijanis might, might have about that. Uh, so the, the point is that this is, this is the, the Russian approach and the, the Western approach in my, uh, I have the impression that the West prefers a package solution 
where Karabakh's uh, Azerbaijan's sovereignty over Karabakh is recognized by Armenia. Uh, however, however, you know it, it does get some status, some kind of a status. Although I haven't seen any any specific statements to that effect, but it is my impression that they're not entirely entirely in line with the argument that Armenians of Karabakh should simply be integrated as um, as citizens of Azerbaijan and have have no um, no special no special political status now uh, the the most uh, the most dangerous thing in this regard is that this creates an opportunity for forum shopping by the parties right and constantly you have this problem of uh, parties going to the Europeans and asking for, or, or the West and asking for something, then going to the Russians. And uh, it creates tremendous uncertainty and incentives to drag one's feet, especially since the international, uh, international situation uh, is quite unstable and in flux and nobody knows how the Ukraine war is going to end. And uh, what and and however it ends, it's going to have to have consequences to have consequences for the region. And I should point out that actually this has been one of the main reasons why the negotiations have stalled, why there have been uh, there, why there has been this tendency to drag one's feet, to issue new demands. To, to change uh, you know, prior promises or commitments. If you remember when the, the, the war had just started, when we had that forum in Istanbul, where you and I were talking about its consequences. And this is precisely what I said then. It had just started, but I, I argued that this is going to have a destabilizing effect in the Caucasus because it's going to create a lot of uncertainty and the parties are going to have incentives to wait and see. Kind of and, and to drag their feet and to engage in a lot of forum shopping, which is never never good for uh, for negotiations. So uh, if if uh, I hope I answered uh, I answered your questions about the status issue, and we can talk about the corridor. Or if there is something else you want to ask about this, um, yeah, uh, I want maybe um, yeah you know uh, it's um, I think. It remains to see, you know, like, um, again, in reality, I think, and I think you and me, we agree that in reality, at the end, uh, this decision will be made, like, um, it's a lot, a lot in this, I think, will depend on Russia. And, and maybe even on, even nobody really likes to talk about it, or maybe even on some bigger trade-offs that, you know, that Russia and Turkey and West might agree or not agree on, you know. Um, so, uh, but let's come then to uh, corridor issue. You, so, uh, why do you think there is, uh, for, so from Azerbaijani perspective, what Azerbaijan wants is road to Nakhichevan. Why does it create so much uh, tension? Because uh, in Azerbaijan, people think if we give you Armenians the connection from Armenia to Karabakh, Armenians, right? So it is just fair, even putting aside it was agreed or not agreed in trilateral statement, you know, as a result of, of the last war. Uh, but it seems to be fair that Azerbaijan is living in the mainland also want to have a similar connection to, you know, uh, Azerbaijan is living in Nakhichevan. So why, why this problem is causing so much discomfort and disagreement, you know, in Armenia, why it cannot be resolved, how it can be resolved? It is again the, uh, it's similar to the the problem I described earlier, a kind of commitment problem. When you have an, a relationship that is asymmetric, uh, the weaker side sometimes has particular fears of making certain concessions or giving certain powers to the other side, which can be exploited for something else. 
there was a there was a paper written and it was never published by one of my professors at the University of Chicago back in the 1990s called bargaining over issues that affect future bargaining power right so whenever you agree to something that can uh, the bargain itself the agreement itself can change uh, change the uh, the bargaining power between the parties or 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 create opportunities for the other side for exploitation then then there is there is a concern now let's put it in the context of you know certain rhetoric that exists in azerbaijan about the historic rights to zangezur and again put that in the context of armenia's current weakness and defenselessness right and uh, uh, the, uh, the the other problem is that armenians have uh, have been talking about, uh, you know, there is no problem. We, yeah, can, I, ready. can I just intervene here? Uh, you know, uh, again, if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, the negotiation goes, if there will be a road from mainland Azerbaijan to Nakhichevan, it will be protected by Russian troops. So basically, it's part of agreement that Russia will provide the security, right? Uh, so just coming back to Armenian fears, like it is, it's, it's, it's kind of impossible that Azerbaijan will start a war with Russia, you know, to occupy, to occupy, you know, Sunnic region, like it is, don't you I see, think, not really, yeah. it's totally unrealistic, no? Again, I, mean, again, I don't, I don't know the, the details of the negotiations. I'm telling you what the, overall generic fears are in Armenia. Some of them may be unjustified, but uh, but again, any, any suggestion that Armenia's sovereignty over that region should be compromised is treated with a lot of anxiety. It is treated with a lot of anxiety also because this is the border connecting Armenia to Iran. And as you have seen, it is also treated with uh, a lot of anxiety in Iran, not just in Armenia, right? So Iranians probably also have the information that it will be under Russian protection, but they're worried, they're worried as well. So there are some concerns there. Moreover, I, it is my impression. Ar Arman, also, uh, this is a concern, like I really want to go into the heart of it because this, like also Iran's concern, like again, this will not be, if I understand correctly, Azerbaijani troops in Armenia, you know. It will be Russian troops in Armenia, which I'm sorry, but they're already in Armenia, you know, like in other parts of Armenia. They're not just, will not be on this road. So they will be part of the Russian troops that are already in Armenia, right? They will come and protect this road. So I don't understand why Iran thinks that uh, Azerbaijan will stop communication of Iran with Armenia. Like again, there will be no troops. Or... Maybe, maybe there are things. Maybe there are things we don't know. I mean, uh, so. Uh, but again, these conversations have been taking place for thirty years. You know, beginning with the Global Plan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah, yeah. And and there are there are legitimate anxieties. Uh, and I'm not saying these anxieties cannot be addressed. You know, they probably can be addressed. And one of, I mean, one of the things that could address it is a kind of third party guarantee that makes such exploitation impossible. But I'm, I'm talking about where these anxieties come from, what, what the concerns are. And uh, the other thing is that Armenians have been offering alternatives to, uh, to connect Azerbe the mainland Azerbaijan with Nakhijevan, alternative routes, alternative transit routes, which would also connect Azerbaijan to Turkey through a shorter uh, route uh, through Armenia, and Azerbaijan is not interested in those. Now, there are all sorts of arguments. We have already built that, uh, that, that train, the, 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 the train line uh, to, toward Mehri, and uh, the other road would be uh, redundant or economically not uh, very necessary, et cetera, et cetera. I know about all those arguments. But uh, I think uh, there is an argument there that perhaps if it is indeed about, uh, about having just access, free, the, the unimpeded access to Nahijevan, uh, perhaps there is, uh, it's, it's not such a bad idea to consider other alternative routes which provoke 
less anxiety in Armenia and less anxiety in Iran. Uh, why not take the other routes? It's a very good question. Uh, I would like also, uh, you know, to add here also for the context, there is always this fear in Armenia that, you know, Azerbaijan, I don't know, may occupy south of Armenia and, well, you know, from, from yeah, say, so say from, from, you know, you know, uh, when uh, I uh, when this um, situation uh, you know came into existence, uh, so uh, Azerbaijani Armenian side suddenly said that there is now Armenian troops are on sovereign sovereign territory of Armenia, right? Azerbaijani troops now yeah. have moved forward into uh, what is international recognized, you know. Uh, borders of Armenia, and, uh, and and Aliyev made such a response, Arman. He said, well, Armenians are accusing us that we have occupied now part of Armenia. Well, why they are not recognizing, you know, the borders? Because they are not recognizing, you know, borders of Azerbaijan. So we don't know where borders are. How they can say that we're occupying part of their territory? It, so, no, uh, what I'm trying to say, Armen, Arman, that, you know, if, if I would look at it from a side, so it looks like Azerbaijan is trying to make argument in Armenia. So if you don't like when somebody is coming and crossing your international, uh, you know, borders, why do you think that you can do this, you know, in some other area with Azerbaijan, but why do you think that Azerbaijan or nobody else can do it with you? So the, this is, um, and, and I understand that in Armenia this comes off as the, you know, and is maybe getting even bigger as a fear of, no, no, no. Azerbaijan wants to, I don't know, occupy whole of Armenia. I've heard even experts saying that, you know, we cannot agree on, you know, Karabakh going back to Azerbaijan or accepting that it is part of Azerbaijan because Azerbaijan will not stop there. You know, it will demand more. There will be genocide. All Armenians will be killed. And I feel like we are trapped into this distrust and fears that, in my opinion, are not... You know, they are not realistic. I don't think, I don't, I don't believe that Azerbaijan has intention, I don't know, to occupy all of Armenia and Azerbaijan, Armenia will stop to exist. Like, this is not possible, right? I it's mean, not, uh, uh, I'm going to do something which I'm loath to do. I don't like to do things like yeah. this because I don't like, you know, turning conversations uh, that I want to be analytical into yeah. defending the Armenian position or you know mutual accusations who said or did what but this is this is probably relevant i mean the azerbaijani behavior yeah. after the war right has not been terribly reassuring and azerbaijan as i have said on numerous occasions with my conversations with my azerbaijani colleagues uh, has more of a responsibility in this regard as a victorious side of that war and i'm going to read just one tweet from ilham aliyev Yes. Armenia is not even a colony. It is not even worthy of being a servant. Yeah. And I can go on and cite stuff like this ad infinitum, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, you have to understand that these, uh, these fears and concerns, right, they, they exist. Uh, they, they have been exaggerated sometimes. It is not that Armenians are innocent and Armenians have not said equally obnoxious and nasty things about Azerbaijan. But, but as I said, after the war, at the state level, coming from the president of the country, where he stands on a, on a road sign which has Armenia written on it and takes a photograph of it, uh, that signals certain kinds of intentions and motives, right, which you cannot ignore. Had he behaved differently, had the Azerbaijani state behaved a little differently and taken, uh, you know, more of a stance of reassurance, perhaps uh, it would be easier for, you know, for people like me to advocate that we should be more open-minded and some of the fears are exaggerated, etc. 
But when the president of the country of Azerbaijan gets up and says Armenians are not even worthy of being servants, right? You can't assume benign motives on the part of that man. No, this is the problem, I think, Arman, that there is no distrust, there is no trust between the parties. There, there is no trust, reasons. which is understandable because we've been there, fighting there is, 30 years and we have had yes. this historical conflict. Too, even for no, long. too many people have been killed, too many uh, horrible things happened. And, you know, and I think sometimes these conversations also, you know, on the highest level in the past and even now and even in online communities, it's like between two, you know, traumatized, wounded people, you know, and... Uh, I can I, I can understand sorry I, to and I don't you. See, I can understand you know, I, I, I can understand if if an ordinary Azerbaijani makes such comments if they are wounded if they are hurt humiliated by 30 years of occupation etc yes a president of a country statesmen don't have you know they shouldn't do stuff like that that doesn't justify nothing justifies statements like that if if again their intention is to really end the confrontation, if their intention is to end the enmity, if their intention is reconciliation and peace. If their intention is something else, then yes, by all means. I mean, they can say whatever they want. But I cannot reconcile, you know, statements uh, about, you know, benign intentions and we want peace and we want reconciliation. It's the Armenian side that is doing this and that. And again, I'm not defending the Armenians. They have said plenty of obnoxious things. But for the victorious country's president to stand up and say they're not even worthy of being servants, and then all the talk about what is it that Armenians are worried about? Why are they worried about these things, right? Uh, we don't have any bad intentions. Uh, half well, of Azerbaijan is talking about Zangezur being historic Azerbaijani lands. I mean, shouldn't Armenians have... And again, I'm not saying that you know, Armenians have not made the same thing, right? But we have a certain situation now. As you say, we have a reality now. And the two sides are have their own concerns, their own worries, and dismissing the Armenian concerns and, and anxieties about these things as completely made up or, or the result of Armenian hypocrisy, I think, uh, I think is not correct. I, I think, you know, uh, benign intentions... Uh, you you will agree with me as a realist are not going to solve this conflict, right? Benign intentions. No, they're not. Are currently I will I can, I will tell you one more because after two years of being in this, you and me we can confirm that benign intentions are already not solving this conflict. Something not at all. else. Something else is solving or not solving this conflict at the moment. But these statements are not irrelevant. I know that you are saying that these statements are not helping to feel confidence in Armenia that, for example, Aliyev statements that are... Jehun, Jehun, Bayramov, Jehun Bayramov, I think yesterday, said that Armenians in Karabakh will have all the same rights Yes. as Azerbaijanis, Azerbaijani citizens, end of story, they have nothing to worry about. How do you want me to reconcile that statement with the statement that Armenians are not even worthy of being servants? Well, I think... And how, how are Karabakh Armenians supposed to think about that? How are they going to... I mean, this is what Azerbaijan wants, right? Uh, I mean, they have nothing to worry about. It's, it's just, you know, their terrorist government, if they... If they pack up and leave, uh, Karabakh Armenians are our citizens. Will 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 treat them uh, will treat them with dignity and and equal rights. Uh, then then you have all the all the rhetoric and all the textbooks and you know statements by statements by by politicians which are completely inconsistent with such an intention of treating Armenians of Karabakh or Armenians in general. Equal, equally and with dignity. And again, I, I know what kind of conversation this triggers, right? And I'm the person who can talk about this because I have spent a lot of time criticizing my own side for engaging in similar disgusting rhetoric. 
Yeah. I'm not the I'm not somebody who only points the finger at Azerbaijanis. Yeah. I've done that a lot. I've done that in domestic uh, our domestic debates, and I have an article that is going to come out in the United States that talks about this. Uh, yeah. But 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 the victorious side, from from and from the victorious side, a lot, like, a lot depends on the victorious side's behavior. Not much depends on the Armenian side's behavior now. Some things do, but not not as much as 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 things depend on the Azerbaijani behavior. And especially, especially if they want Karabakh Armenians uh, to be reassured, if they want Armenians to be reassured in general about you know we're just going to open up the borders and we're going to communicate and and do trade and live in peace and harmony after all these issues are resolved. These sort of statements are not irrelevant, and they're not they're not simply not like it's not being a non-realist worrying about these sort of manifestations of attitude and intentions. So we not obviously, Arman, we obviously see that uh, the uh, Azerbaijan's government, current government, doesn't believe that this conflict can be solved with good intentions, right? Uh, and what, what we see is that, and you, I think we agree on this, that what's going on is basically negotiation involving not just Azerbaijan and Armenia, but most importantly Russia. Um, and um, we are now at the stage where uh, it seems to me uh, that, you know, everyone talks about peace agreement, but from all this conversations and all this tension that is in the air, I can feel that mm, we are not coming to an agreement. Like, I cannot really see. Do you think that what's happening here, is there is a chance for this peace agreement and the current circumstances to be achieved in the coming months? Or do you think we're moving, or do you think we're moving away from peace agreement more towards another phase of conflict or another another war unfortunately i think uh, you know the one of the points that we were discussing a little while ago i think that's the most important thing as important as these other things are we don't exist in a vacuum and usually when you have such uh, such instability at the international level and we have found ourselves in the in the at the center not at the center but at, at um, you know at some uh, area in some area of great power competition right uh, these sort of competitions never never produce good results for any region right so and and now you have you have all this competition all this uncertainty all this flux right it's a it's a very very unstable situation in our region and anything can happen. So the 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 peace out the peaceful outcome is going to be likely when there is more of uh, a stability, when there is more of a convergence of expectation between great powers of what can and cannot be done in our region or elsewhere, and then and then there will be both more of an opportunity for uh, for. Uh, meaningful negotiations and there will be also pressure on us on, on both sides to reach an agreement if it is in the interests of uh, of the relevant great powers so without that i i'm i'm afraid you know we're we are going to uh, you know keep struggling with this and uh, there is going to be more and more instability and uh, more and more resistance to uh, to coming to a final agreement, uh, but again, uh, our behavior, the behavior of the Armenian Azerbaijani governments and societies, is not completely irrelevant either, right? Mm -hmm. So that that we should not simply resign ourselves to this to this notion that nothing depends on us and it doesn't matter anyway, and uh, we should we should try to to figure out. Uh, under what conditions we would be able? What are the what are the minimal uh, expectations or minimal demands upon which we agree to sign that peace agreement and to live with it? Right. 
So that, that's an important conversation. I think we should keep having that. And at the end, I want to, because again, I think we, uh, we agree that many of the problems and even statements or even policies that are being pursued now uh, from both sides, uh, you know, they are coming from this great distrust, you know, from this past failings of, I don't know, understanding each other, compromising with each other. So what do you think, uh, maybe at the end of the conversation, if you have any thoughts about what could Armenians and Azerbaijanis, both, both governments and societies, do to, I don't know, to, to have more trust, to build this trust? Like, what can be done in, in your view? For starters, we should, we, should, uh, we should refrain and really seriously refrain from engaging in this kind of rhetoric, especially at the governmental level. That's unbecoming of statesmen. Statesmen should not use that kind of language. Uh, and uh, it, it is both unbecoming of them and, and dangerous and not conducive to, uh, to changing the atmosphere. I understand conflict. I understand disagreement. But this sort of language, this sort of rhetoric is, is just poisonous and it should be avoided. And, and both Armenians and Azerbaijanis should do it at the governmental level and at the societal level. Uh, of course, I mean, on both sides, there are going to be people, but again, especially people who have, who have some, um, uh, who, who have power in the government, who, who also have authority in their societies, they, they, should, they should refrain from, from that kind of language. And, and again, I want to emphasize that this is directed both at Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Uh, we should also... Um, we should also be more prepared to have these conversations and to listen to each other and to understand to understand what the realistic solutions are. Uh, we should understand each other's grievances and fears, right? The tendency is always to hear somebody on the other side and say, yeah, but you did this. But, you know, you had this other position somewhere, like to expose the other side's hypocrisy, to expose the other side's, you know, the illegitimacy of the other side's positions. I think if we, uh, especially if we're talking about the second track, if we're talking about, you know, expert to ex expert conversations, we should try to understand each other's societies, grievances and fears. We should learn to listen to each other instead of shouting at each other and instead of hurling accusations to each other. And, 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 uh, and uh, certainly we should stop hurling uh, insults at each other. Uh, so that's, that's the minimum that can be done. Also, I think uh, we, should, we should be more realistic about, uh, about what can and cannot be done without the involvement of third parties, right? I, th I think it is, it is the sad fact of international relations that countries like Armenia and Azerbaijan don't exist in a vacuum. It's not just up to us. We have to understand, we have to be able, and we have to learn to reconcile our interests and demands and grievances with, uh, with, uh, with the interests of important actors in, in, the international, in the international arena, instead of just complaining about it and... Uh, you know, again, talking about some universal principles of justice. Arman, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Emil. Uh, Restart Initiative, you know, uh, we had this uh, uh, dialogue in, in June uh, in Berlin uh, discussing how these transport routes can be opened. And I hope in December and January we're going to have two uh, other big events on energy and water management. And I think that these conversations are important, you know, regardless of, you know, where these negotiations will be, where what will or will not happen, you know, on the front line. In, in my opinion, it's very important that we keep these conversations open because the more we're going to talk about this, the more we're going to have meetings and events like this, uh, the more also, you know, the, the public discussions currently, they... Uh, really focus on what Azerbaijan and Armenia could win, you know, from resolving the conflict, from opening all the borders. Because, because um, 
You know, when I started the Restart Initiative, I was thinking this as development organization. So I wanted to do some development projects in Azerbaijan, in the South Caucasus. But uh, for me, this Armenian-Azerbaijan dialogue came as priority because I think if we achieve, if the peace agreement will be signed, if we start, you know, developing cooperation in all these different areas, you know, it is unbelievable what kind of potential in Armenia and Azerbaijan will be unlocked, you know, for economic prosperity and all these resources that are unfortunately been invested into hating each other for the last 30 years, could be unlocked and spent on education, on economy, I don't know, on increasing immensely the quality of life of both in Armenia and Azerbaijan. This is why uh, I would like to thank your participation and uh, your patience. Uh, and I would like to wish that we talk more often, Arman, because I think uh, it's very important, um, you know, to keep this conversation going and trying to give, you know, people in Armenia and Azerbaijan to engage in more constructive dialogues, honestly, than in more what you described as this mutual insults and uh, because there is a lot of that, honestly, and I'm really tired of watching, commenting, even participating in all this. But I also think this is happening because um, people who can talk constructively and who can try, you know, to listen and to bring their own arguments or arguments of their own societies in a very, you know, rational way to the other side. Unfortunately, I see very few such people and uh, most people uh, as, as you, you know, you, uh, I believe uh, they are either too busy or they see so much negativity, you know, that they don't want to be even, uh, you know, just one voice in all of this. But uh, I would like, again, to use this opportunity to thank you for participation. And I hope, you know, I will be able to meet and talk to more Armenians. Uh, in uh, English, but also in Russian, so we can have, you know, more and more people, you know, not just accusing each other, but also listening to each other, because uh, I think our conversation today will be heard in Baku, in Yerevan, and I'm sure also in Moscow and Ankara too, and uh, in other capitals in Europe and in DC. So I hope this is our small contribution to developing this kind of software for our conversation between our two societies. Uh, thank you, Amin, and thank you for the invitation as well as all the all the work you do. It is important. It is it is also very meaningful work to gather people, specialists, experts who can really uh, demonstrate what the potential for for cooperation is between the two two countries, and um, I think I think you're doing uh, doing an important and, um, and and noble work by by facilitating that. следующий раз поговорим по русски. В этот раз я я просто не знал как перевести commitment problem. Thank you very much, Arman. Thank you very Thank much. You. Ciao. Take care. Bye.